I'm Stephen Holmes. I teach here at the law school. I'm a very great welcome to our guest, Alexandra Matichuk, who is, as you know, uh, the winner of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize last year. And um, uh, it's really an honor to have you here. And it's also, it's also even, it's moving to have you here. You're, you're such a articulate and effective voice helping the rest of us understand what your country has gone through in the last 20 months. It's been 20 months now. Of course, it started before that, but it was really in February 2022 when Russia began its homicidal rampage across your country that the terrible suffering has begun. And you've helped us keep this in mind. Um, you're not just someone who bears witness to all the atrocities, which you do do, but you're also a, a kind of representative of the refusal of Ukrainians to be broken by a war that seems to be aiming at breaking Ukrainian spirit. And I, I'm sure you're bruised. Uh, you know, people have lost friends. They've watched their country be destroyed. It's a terrible thing to go through, but uh, you're the dignity with which you present yourself and the resilience with which you keep speaking is a, really a tribute to your country and, of course, to you. We have an hour. I'm going to spend, well, the clock is ticking, sometime less than half an hour uh, having a fireside chat discussion with Alexandra. And then we're going to open it up to questions. So prepare your questions, succinct questions, and no speeches. Um, now, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I think maybe a good way to start in order to help the audience understand what's at stake in this war is to understand the meaning, the way you understand, the way Ukrainians understand occupation. Because uh, it, it tells us what's at stake in this war, because if Ukraine laid down its arms, uh, the country as a whole would be occupied. And you have a lot of experience with occupation, first of all in the East, but uh, also in the zones that the Russian army occupied and then Ukrainian forces took over. So what, have you, what, do you, what can you tell us about what it means to live under Russian occupation? You're totally right. Some people confuse the word peace with the word occupation. And Ukrainians want peace much more than anyone else. But peace doesn't come when country which was invaded stop fighting. That's not peace. That's occupation. Occupation is horrible. It's just another form of the war. And I know what I'm talking about because I documented war crimes for nine years already. Um, People in occupied territories live in the gray zone. They have no tools how to defend their rights, their freedoms, their property, and their beloved ones. Russian occupation is not just changing one state flag to another. Russian occupation means enforced disappearances, torture, sexual violence, denial of your identity, forcible adoption of your child, and transfer them to Russia, filtration camps, and mass graves. I will tell you one story just to illustrate it, but I will start it with the point when Russians occupy the territory. It's one thing, but they need to keep the control over the territory. It's another thing. And in order to achieve this aim, Russian troops physically determinate the active local people there. It's not just mayors or local deputies. It can be lawyers, journalists, priests, artists, any active people of community. Last year, Ukrainian forces liberated Kharkiv region. It's one oblast in Ukraine, near with Russian borders. And we sent our mobile group there, and we found the dead bodies of men, women, and children in mass graves. Uh, in the forest, um, and before uh, we got a lot of requests for help because people were disappeared from this region, and one request was from 
family of children writer Volodymyr Vakulenko. Uh, he was a children writer. He wrote uh, beautiful stories for children and entire generation of Ukrainian children brought up on their book, on his book. But during Russian occupation, he disappeared. His family hoped to the last that uh, his, uh, he, he survived. Uh, but just like thousands of other Ukrainian civilians are in, in Russian captivity. But we found a grave under the number 319. And after identification, we revealed that this is a body of Volodymyr Vakulenko. And you know his family personally. It's very difficult for them to accept the result of this identification. And you may ask me, for what Russian soldiers abducted children writer, <laughs> torture and kill him? The answer is, because they could. One, of the, one aspect of uh, occupation is that for weeks at a time, Ukrainian, some Ukrainians have been stuck in the basements of buildings, not allowed to come out, not able this actually has to do with Ukrainian identity, not able to see the horizon. And when you know that the Ukrainian flag, in a way, is a symbol of the Ukrainian horizon, that's itself part of an attack on Ukrainian identity. And we're going to talk a little bit about this as an identity war in a minute. Now, you're trained as a lawyer, um, and law is a nonviolent way of dealing with conflicts. But you find yourself you know, touring... Western developed countries and asking for weapons, that is, for violent tools. Um, and, uh, and you say that's because you don't have any legal tools or the legal system doesn't work. And of course, in a way, that's one of the goals of war for Putin. He wants to show that the legal tools don't work, that the human rights don't protect you, that the rule of law is just a figment that naive liberals believe in but doesn't have any effect, that the victims aren't going to be given justice, that the perpetrators aren't going to be held accountable, and so on. That's almost an, a warring. Now, there are, I think, some, we have some evidence that law can be used in some ways. We have the ICC uh, uh, arrest warrant for Putin and his commissioner of uh, children's rights and so on. Um, but. Uh, I think if you, if you agree, a way to start to talk about what a lawyer who is willing to trespass a little beyond the law can do in a situation like this. And if we could go back, if you could tell us a little bit about the Euromaidan SOS, and, and particularly about how under, in a condition in which the legal institutions are controlled by the people who violate human rights, how you can nevertheless fight on a symbolic level against them. And I think that is probably still relevant today. We will return nine years ago when our previous uh, government decided to stop the integration process. And for use in my country, it means that we not just stop the integration process, we return to so-called Russian world. And students started a demonstration on Maidan uh, and uh, the crucial point was when the government decided brutally disperse this peaceful student demonstration. Uh, you can Google and find a video how it's happened, how this was happened. Uh, Ukrainian students, they, they sing national song and were severely beaten in the live broadcasting. So. It was a huge shock for Ukrainian society, and next day, half a million of people appeared in the street. And this was also a start for me to create, together with my team, the civil initiative, which is called Yevromaidan SOS. And we brought up several thousands of people to provide legal and other assistance to prosecuted protesters. We worked 24 hours a day during the whole Revolution of Dignity, and every day, hundreds and hundreds of people who were beaten, who were tortured, who were kidnapped, who were f accused and fabricated criminal administrative charges passed through our care. 
And this was a time when we face against the whole state machine because paramilitary group Tetushki worked together with prosecutor's office. The prosecutor office cooperates with courts, the security service, the president, the government, the majority of parliament were against us. They want to liquidate peaceful protest, even physically. And in such a circumstances, it was so easy to say, but what can I do when the law doesn't work? But our lawyers and our volunteers fight very honestly for each person, for each procedure's measures. And suddenly, we really start to work not just on a legal, but on symbolic level, the level where ideas and senses emerged. And the main idea which we bring to Revolution of Dignity at the time, it was that there is no guarantee in our life. You can be beaten, you can be arrested, you can even be killed, but there are people who will fight for you, who will never left you alone, who will do their best to release you and never forget about your family. And this helps people to overcome the fear and continue the struggle. And from this time, I'm very confident that not just in Ukraine, in many parts of the world, people are fighting for democracy, for their freedom, and for their human dignity. And very often, these efforts may seem that they have no sense because of the enormous opposing power. But the history of humankind convincingly proves that you have to continue your fight honestly and result, even unexpectedly, will be achieved. Maybe just to, to make it not just the words but something personally, I will tell you my story. I was a coordinator of this initiative and the culmination of Revolution of Dignity was when government decided to gunning down peaceful protesters on the center of the cave. And it was very difficult uh, days. Uh, it's lasting for several hours, this gunning down of peaceful protesters. And before we work, like, we use one algorithm. We sent our lawyers to prisons, to detention center, to hospitals, to the court, and try to protect people. But when police killed people, you can't send the lawyer. It's absurd. So we sent our lawyers and our volunteers to the morgues, to the hospitals, to the places where dead bodies were gathered. Because we understood that the government decided to physically destroy the peaceful protest. And we was very hurry because we don't know how much time we have before police will come and kill us. And I remember that I was in office and trying to coordinate all these efforts. And we received the documents, the photos of documents, picture of these dead bodies. And trying our heart to identify these people and to make a list and to preserve the evidence, not to allow the government in future to hide these atrocities. And because of this work, we know that it's not just 10 or 20 people were killed. And it's still, the shooting is still going on. And in this time, exactly time, I got a phone from my own husband. And he told me that I am on my down. He said that I love you. And he said goodbye. And it was maybe the, the most scary moment in my entire life. Because you understand what is going. And as a person who loves your husband, I want to say, please run away from here. But I have no moral right to say this. 
because people who stand in Maidan also have the families, kids, their lives. I'm lucky because my husband returned alive, but more than 100 people didn't return. So it's a price for freedom, which we paid nine years ago during the Revolution of Dignity, just for a chance to build a country where the rights of everybody are protected, government is accountable, judiciary is independent, and police do not beat students who are peacefully demonstrating. And we got a chance to provide a democratic transition in and Russia, in order to stop us on this way, started this war of aggression nine years ago. Russia immediately occupied Crimea, part of Lugansk and Donetsk regions, and last year extended this war to the large-scale invasion. And now Russia tried to justify this war of aggression from different reasons. But Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom which came closer to Russian borders nine years ago. Excellent, thank you. So I want to kind of follow up on what you just said. You're, you're aware that many people, not many, but some voices in the West are pressure, want uh, Zelensky to sit down with Putin and negotiate some kind of armistice. And I think you could say that whether or not Putin is a, would be a reliable partner depends a little bit on what you think he's trying to do in this war. I mean, as you said, one of the things is to prove that he has impunity. Um, but what, so I guess what I'm asking is what is, how do you understand the crime, the basic crime that he has committed? I mean, you can talk about aggressive war that's well understood. Um, uh, crimes against humanity, there are war crimes, there is uh, transporting children, but do you think that the, the category genocide is the right one? There, this is in a way an identity war, but and there is a war against Ukrainian identity, but do you think, is genocide the correct category? I will start with the point that it's wishful thinking that you can stop Putin with a dialogue. <laughs> concentration camp of Nazi Germany didn't stop by a dialogue. It, it was stopped by force. And the law was restored after the Nazi regime had collapsed. Russia is empire. Empire has a center but has no borders. If empire has energy, empire always want to expand. If empire has no energy, empire will wait for the moment to have it. And Putin governed the country not just with uh, censorship and uh, repressions, but with a special social contract between Kremlin's elite and Russian people. And the problem is that even in the 21st century, majority of Russians see their Russian glory in forcible restoration of Russian empire. So this is not just a war, one person. And this is a problem. So all this how, which we now face in Ukraine, with forcible deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia, with torturing people in filtration camps, with uh, denial and banning of Ukrainian language and culture, with physical extermination of uh, local active people on the ground, and many other crimes, it's just a result of total impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades. Let me remind you that Russia commits horrible crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. They have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. Let me tell you, I interviewed more than hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity since 2014. They told me horrible stories, how they were beaten, raped, packed into wooden boxes, and their fingers were cut, their nails were torn away, 
their nails were drilled, they were electrically shocked through their genitalia, they were compelled to write with their own blood. I never forget when one woman told me how her eye was dug out with a spoon. There is no legitimate purpose in doing such a things, even during the war. Because there is no military necessity in doing this. Russians did these terrible things only because they could. Because Russia uses war crimes at the methods of our fear. Russia attempts to break people's resistance and occupy Ukraine by the tool which I call the immense pain on civilian population. And now we record all these crimes, not just as violations of Geneva and Hague conventions. We document human pain. And because we have in our database more than 54,000 episodes of war crimes, I can see that this is a war which has a genocidal character. Because even when we take this recent arrest warrant imposed by International Criminal Court, when they identify the forcible deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia as a war crimes, it's just a component of this genocidal policy. And this policy started from the top when Putin and his surrounding, surrounding openly said that there is no Ukrainian nation, there is no Ukrainian language, there is no Ukrainian culture. If you know Russian language, you can then monitor how Russian propagandists interpret these words. They publicly said that Ukrainians has to be either re-educated as Russians or killed. And then we see what we see on the ground. This abducting and killing of child writers, this deportation of Ukrainian children and re-educated them as Russians. And first, uh, what Russian soldiers want from ch teachers from uh, school in occupied Berdyansk, as they told me, it was books on Ukrainian language and Ukrainian history. I know as a lawyer that genocide is a crime of crimes and there is a very difficult to prove it according to the all international standard. But let's be not just lawyers but as a human beings and use a common sense. If you want partially or totally destroy some national groups. There is no necessity to kill them all. You can forcibly change their identity and the entire national group will disappear. Yeah, thank you. Um, still, there seems to be something in a way stronger or unique and uniquely deranged about this war that distinguishes it from what Putin was doing in Syria or Chechnya and so on. Um, Lemkin, when he, uh, Raphael Lemkin, when he defined genocide, he was thinking of the Nazi experience and, and he didn't blame Germans for kidnapping Jewish children and trying to brainwash them into being Aryans, which is what Putin, I mean, it's a diff, there's something different here, partly, as you've explained there, it's, he's saying, you Ukrainians don't exist, you're really Russians. If you don't admit it, we will kill you or destroy your country, or we are going to use violent indoctrination on you, steal your children. So what he's, from his perspective, he's killing his own. This is a particular, almost madness. And I think that, if, you can, if we can grasp, I don't think the category of genocide quite captures this unique, I think historically unprecedented form of horror. horror. Uh, and it's not you know, legal uh, definitions here, but it's to point out that a person who would do this is not someone you can sit down with. I want to return to your word madness. It's not madness, 
this cruelty is very rational. I told that from the beginning of the war, I worked with the cases of people who survived the hell because they were in captivity and went through the experience which, if I can, I want to forget. But in some time, I start to ask to myself, what is the minds in the hearts of people who are doing such things? Because I always work with victims of war crimes and start to think, what feel, what think, how breath their perpetrators? And I start to read a lot of psychological articles and literature and some philosophers uh, who reflected about the Nazi Germany and other phenomena of cruelty. I try to find an answer for myself. I don't know why it was so important for me. And what I understand, I will try to, uh, to explain this with one experiment which was done uh, by scientists, it's rather cruel experience. They beat uh, one animal, I don't remember, let's be dog, with electricity, when this animal tried to eat. And this led to a situation that this poor dog decided to die with the pain of hunger, but didn't provide any attempt to survive. And this phenomenon was called learned helplessness. I have a feeling that Russians now try to impose this horrible experiment to the whole nation. They deliberately provide a lot of pain to deprive us from energy to resist. But they miscalculated because we are not Russians. And when you take the World Survey review about values, you will see that Ukrainians always put freedom on the first place. We will not stop. We have no other choice. If we stop fighting, they will be no more us. Okay, one more question from me and then we're going to open it up. So um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the difference between rights and stories or the difference between, or the difficulty of um, giving people back their names, the victims, when there are so many victims. Uh, it's obvious that in a legal sense, uh, courtrooms aren't big enough to have hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of perpetrators in court. So there's a, there's a limit to the ability of legal institutions to uh, punish crimes that are committed by so many people. Uh, but it's also, uh, uh, just from your point of view, because I think you're, you are really very much focused on doing justice to the victims, and how do you manage that when the numbers grow so great? I articulated this task very clearly for myself when I heard the wife of one uh, victim of our crimes in the court. And this is a story about 62-year-old civilian Alexander Shalipov. He was killed by Russian soldiers near his own house. And this tragedy received the huge media attention only because it was the first court trial after large-scale invasion started. And his wife, Katerina, told in the court that her husband was an ordinary farmer, but he was her whole universe. And she told to the judge that she lost everything. In that moment, you understand that people are not numbers. And only justice can return people their names and their human dignity. And that is why I articulate that our task is to, to provide justice to all victims of this war, regardless who they are. Do they have a high social position or not? What type of crime and level of cruelty they endured? and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their case. We must return people their names because life of each person matters. And it's possible. We live in 21st century. We have a digital instruments which provide us an opportunity to restore what happened, 
to collect evidence and to identify perpetrators, which we can't even dream 15 years ago. Like, ordinary people with a smartphone can make essential photos and videos, and sooner or later we'll have access at least to part of them. Our colleagues are cooperated with some American university which have access to satellite images. Can you imagine to be like ordinary human rights defenders and to have access to satellite images and you can explore how the size of my graves on the occupied territories become bigger and bigger? <laughs> the work of Bellingcat and other investigators convincingly proved that in order to restore what was happened, sometimes there is no necessity even being in a spot. So technically, it's possible to provide chance for justice to each person. Now we have to change our justice architecture on national and international level to be able to do it. And I think there's a problem not in law, because law is dynamic material. You can develop it in line with the current needs. The problem is in our perception of the world. One example, when I spoke with presidents, with uh, members of governments or parliaments, I have the impression that all these people still look to the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trials, where Nazi war criminals were tried, but only after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we live in a new century. Justice shouldn't be dependent on how and when the war will end. We cannot wait. We must establish special tribunal on aggression now and hold Putin, Lukashenko, the top political leadership and high military command of Russian state accountable. And this is a courageous step. But we must do it because this is the right thing to do. Thank you. There are two microphones. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Otto Lehto. I'm a PhD, no, sorry, postdoc now, as you say. <laughs> a postdoc here um, at law school. Um, so um, I have a question about, um, about how do you get people to see that your struggle is also uh, a broader struggle. It's a struggle of uh, people of the West, of democracies, liberal countries. Now, now, I come from Finland, where we understand quite easily um, the, the historical injustices of the Russian regime. And I think a lot of countries in Europe understand this quite well. So it, it's not a hard sell for people to understand why this cannot be isolated as your struggle, even though, of course, it is your struggle. But perhaps my question is, how can you convince people who do not have that immediate historical regional connection um, of the importance of this um, because perhaps people would say, well, it's not our struggle. Um, why, why does it concern us? And of course, here I'm primarily talking about the United States since that's where we are. Do you worry about the attention span of um, US public and government? And how do you think that it's best to have them understand the shared nature of this struggle? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, complex question. I will try to provide maybe a very simple answer. I will start with a story of my human rights colleague from Syria. When large-scale invasion started, they sent me a letter of support and they told me that please tell us what you need. We'll do everything because your success, it will be our success. So they understood that the event in Syria lost attention because Russia invaded Ukraine, but it's not about competition. It's about joining efforts to fight with a common evil. What do I mean? I think that 
the situation in Ukraine, the situation in Syria, the situation in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, in Sudan, put a very clear question, which has to be very important for you as lawyers. How we people in 21st century will defend a human beings, their lives, their freedom, and their dignity? Can we rely on the law? Or does just brutal force matter? And the answer to this question will define the future not only of people in Ukraine, Syria, China, Sudan, and Afghanistan. The answer to this question will define our common future. Because we live in a very interconnected world. And in this regard, this war has a value dimension. It's not just a war between two states, Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. It's the same thing that the, our rights as a woman depend whether or not Iranian women succeed in their struggle. Because in our interconnected world, only spread of freedom make our world safer. And one, like, um, returning to a question, uh, very simple answer. I never try never convince people. I try to find allies. People who understand that when Putin started this war of aggression, he tried to show that country with a strong military potential and nuclear weapon can break international order, can dictate the rules to entire international community, and even forcibly change the internationally recognized borders. And if Russia succeeds, it will encourage other authoritarian leaders in the world to do the same. International system of peace and security is not working. This means that democratic governments will be forced to invest their money not in education, healthcare, culture, or business development, not in solving global problems like climate change or social inequality, but in weapons. And we will witness an emergence on a number of nuclear states, the emergence of robotic armies and new weapons of mass destruction. So if Russia succeeds and this scenario comes true, we'll find ourselves in a world which will be dangerous for everyone without any exception. So it's not about convincing. I know human nature is pretty the same. People start to notice that the war is going on only when bombs fall on their heads. I'm searching for allies who understand the responsibility, not only for themselves, but for humankind in general. Uh, hi, I'm a first year student at the law school at NYU. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you foresee the role of Center for Civil Liberty and other civil society organizations in Ukraine um, after the war ends and after justice is received in rebuilding Ukraine and in making sure Russia never invades us again? Thank you. I l like your optimistic question. <laughs> Because the truth is that we don't know, are we in the middle of the war? Are we in the end of the war? Or are we just in the beginning of the war? We live in total uncertainty. So thank you for this question and for your optimism. I will respond with the definition of what victory means for Ukrainians. Victory for Ukrainians is not just to repel Russian troops out from Ukrainian territory, to restore international order, to release people in Crimea, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and other regions which are under temporary Russian occupation. But victory for Ukraine is to succeed in democratic transition of our country. And this means that even after the victory, we'll have a lot to be done, because we're still a nation of transit. We demonstrate success, and that is why Russia started this war, but still a lot of has to be done. 
But I will tell you the sign of success, because sometimes you need to see success to empower you to do more and more. Uh, I work in human rights field for 20 years. I'm also optimism. Because if you are pessimist and you work in Ukraine, <laughs> in human rights field for 20 years, it's, it's too much. So, um, after Revolution of Dignity, we uh, got this chance for democratic transition and we fulfilled two tasks. First, we have to defend ourselves against Russian aggression, but parallel, we have no luxury to concentrate only on this issue. We have to make democratic reforms. And I was involved in the reform of police. And Ukrainian police consists of five parts, and the reform started with a patrol service. And I was also uh, of the program of human rights for new policemen. And it was um, all Ukrainian program, all old police were fired, and the new people came because they believe in the goal and start to be teached what does it mean to serve people as policemen. And I teach the first policeman. And it was a miracle when, when this new policeman appeared in the street. In two weeks, the sociological survey shows the huge increase level of trust to police in general. Because it was something unbelievable. Before, we saw police and we tried to go to another part of the road, just in case, just to be secure. But now, they tell you, Alexandra, hello. <laughs> How are your day? We know you, you teach us. So for me personally, and for millions of Ukrainians, it was a huge difference. But also this is a question, like good story that uh, reforms, it's like a bicycle. When you start it, you have not to stop it. I told you that we have five components of police and reform was started only with first one and unfortunately stopped for some time and we lost. This, um, this achievement, um, and now have to start again. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, um, I'm a visiting scholar from US Asia Law Institute, and I also from another intention area. I'm a judge from Taiwan, and I'm very curious. Uh, Sometimes we don't have the uh, same value, like the human rights or welfare. It is because some uh, dictators uh, control the country. It's not democracy value, something like that. So how could we prevent such a thing, like a real conflict, a war, before the real war happen? How, how, how should we do? Because we, we don't have an equal platform to discuss or communicate between country and country or area to area. So how should we do, or anything could be uh, available for the war from uh, your viewpoint for Ukraine? Thank you. The honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> because the future is unpredictable, uh, it's unclear and unguaranteed. But what I know for sure, that we have to do everything which we can in order to create a version of future which we want to create. And maybe our Ukrainian story will be useful for people in Taiwan. Because when large-scale invasion started, the international organizations evacuated their personnel. But ordinary people remained. And ordinary people started to do extraordinary things. It were ordinary people who helped to survive under artillery's fire. It were ordinary people who took people out from the ruined cities. It were ordinary people who broke to the encirclement to provide humanitarian aid. And suddenly, it's become very visible that ordinary people have a much more power than they can even imagine. We get used to thinking in the categories of states and interstate organization, but mass mobilization of ordinary people around the globe can change the world history quicker than the UN intervention. So because Security Council is paralyzed and unfortunately UN is not fulfill their function to prevent wars properly, I think that the best way is to be prepared. 
and it's up to people in Taiwan to understand what everybody can do on his or her place to be prepared. Hello, my name is Kimmel von Haugwitz. I'm an NYU law student from Germany. And my question is, how are you able to preserve democratic structures in Ukraine during a time of war? Because the way I imagine it, you can hardly aff afford to become dysfunctional, yet it's probably very difficult to keep a democracy alive in these difficult times. And um, the way I also understand it is in order for Ukraine to become a member of the EU, the EU expects some steps to be taken. Um, what do you think needs to be done in order for Ukraine to have a clear path to becoming an EU member? Thank you. Not to lose belief. I will start answering to this uh, very important question with some funny story. I was in France, uh, and my friend drove me from a TV channel to the hotel, and she told me, look uh, how drivers violate the rules of road because of the rain. And I asked her, but what happens if snow will start it? And she told me, everything will stop in France. Everything will stop. And... I start to laugh and say, you are not prepared for a, shut, uh, for a blackout of electricity. <laughs> because for that moment, Russia destroyed the whole energy infrastructure in Ukraine, and we found ourselves in the flats without electricity, light, heating in the winter. <laughs> and then internet and even mobile uh, connection was disappeared. And we managed to survive, to help to each other, and we overcome this hard winter. So what I want to say with this example, that war is poison, and war provides dramatic changes on society, and this is the opposite direction of democratization, because war needs centralization. When we speak about democratic reforms, it's about decentralization. War uh, needs and demands the uh, limitation of uh, human rights and freedoms due to security requirements. For example, we have a curfew, and you have to return home till 11 every day. And because uh, even till 10, because the price for taxi become like you are driving to Cosmos. So, and democratic reforms need exp expanding the space for human rights and freedom. So it's two opposite directions. And we know from history examples of countries who managed to create during the war effective state institutions in order to survive. But it's very difficult, to be honest, to create during the war effective democratic state institutions. And we have to do it. Because you are totally right, we get seven recommendations, let's be several requirements from EU in order to prove our candidate status. And we have no luxury to concentrate it only to survival issues. We have to succeed in democratic transition and to win the value dimension of this war. Which means that we have to do very difficult and ambitious tasks uh, countries uh, of EU have never been in such position as Ukraine has for current moment, but all of these countries know how difficult to make democratic transition even during the peaceful time. We have to make this democratic transition during the time of large-scale war. So, wish us success. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, I'm Yuri, I'm a first-year law student. Uh, my question is a bit more of a forward-looking one, but how can lawyers and law students uh, help Ukraine in, in its reconstruction, both now, during wartime, and afterwards? And I'm asking as a Ukrainian-American who's looking to hopefully help and also apply what we're learning in law school. Thank you. There are a lot of things which uh, can be done, and I will be glad to exchange uh, cards after this conversation and to speak more practically, but I will have one general request. Please, be our ways. Demand justice. Because 
the leaders, even of democratic countries, are still afraid to prosecute the Putin and his surrounding, because this is a regime which haven't collapsed yet. And this is a true. So now we are working on establishing a special tribunal on aggression. Because even International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression in situation of Russian war against Ukraine. And there is no other international court who can prosecute Putin and his surrounding. And all these atrocities which we documented, it's a result of their leadership decision to initiate, to plan, and to start this war. And we try to convince states to create such a tribunal. And this is not an easy task, because yes, we have states uh, who are fully on our side. Uh, it's a state who suppose that Russia will go next to them, like Poland, <laughs> Lithuania, Estonia. They, they literally understand the threat that if he will not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. But it's very easy to imagine that Russia will create their own tribunal. Russia can invite Iran, Afghanistan, Venezuela, North Korea, and transfer the idea of justice into absurd. That means that we have to create such a special tribunal in a, in, in a frame of international organizations. And the priority is to create it in a frame of UN, because this is a world level, which means that we have to get two-third majority of votes of countries who are participants of General Assembly. And we still have no votes from United States, even. Because um, going to details, this March, the State Departments made a statement that they are welcome the idea of special tribunal, but only in the form of hybrid tribunal, which means that such a tribunal will be a part of national system and have no power to overcome immunity with Putin has, according to the international law. And that is why we are grateful that this idea is recognized, but we try still to convince our United States partners that to create a tribunal in a form which not provide them ability to prosecute the most responsible person for crime of aggression, it's a little bit absurd. So be our voice. Demand uh, from your government. Organize uh, conference and discussions about special tribunal in the form of international court. You can do a lot. You live in democracy. And we will be very grateful for your assistance. So I understand that you're willing to stay around for a little bit to talk to any students who want to exchange your coordinates. I don't know how much time you have. Join me in thanking our guests.